thank you so much. Really appreciate being here. Again, I always like coming to this meeting. Uh, it's always a nice drive. It's out in the middle of nowhere, so it's always, it's always really nice. <laughs> Very peaceful, you know, get out of the city. All right, so we're going to be talking about management considerations as we head into the 2017 season. And I'm going to focus on fire blight, of course. Uh, that's always a pressing problem anywhere you grow apples, especially east of the Mississippi River. Powdery mildew and scab, I'm going to talk about those in tandem. Uh, basically what I've learned over the last like three seasons with regards to the products that are out there and how to use them the best as far as what I've learned. And then finally I'm going to talk about using copper in, in cover sprays on apples. Now this isn't so much a discussion about disease control, it's more a discussion of how different coppers affect fruit finish because I always get this question anytime I talk about copper everyone's like well how does this affect the fruit finish because copper can be phytotoxic since it's a general biocide that is of significant concern so this past season we looked at different coppers to try to answer that question at least to develop some kind of foundation uh, for information for folks so for fire blade for anyone who was at the Hershey meeting this is going to be a very condensed version of my fire blight uh, talk. So talk about with regards to managing blossom blight and shoot blight tools that are available to you, new tools that you may not be thinking about. As far as a brief discussion about antibiotics and alternatives um, of two antibiotics to manage blossom blight at bloom time. And then finally, how to best mitigate shoot blight as far as different options for that. With regards to blossom blight management, the number one thing you need to do is to closely monitor the weather conditions around bloom time. This past season, in 2016, our bloom time was in mid-late April. And the conditions weren't really conducive for fire blight, so it was a pretty easy season for folks. And then it got cold. And then the, war then the warmth started um, up again at the end of May, but it really wasn't an issue for us. So as a result, by monitoring the weather conditions at that time, you can kind of juggle the options that are available to you. Streptomycin still works. I did an evaluation in Pennsylvania the last three seasons, 14, 15, and 16. We did not detect any streptomycin resistance or winia amylabra, which is a good thing. I've not looked at Maryland, but I'm assuming the best with regards to Maryland that I don't think that there, are, there would be any potential management failures with regards to using streptomycin. So streptomycin still works. When using streptomycin, you want to be very proactive with regards to resistance management. Just because we don't have it or I'm not detecting it doesn't mean that we can rest on our laurels. So as far as you want to limit the number of streptomycin sprays that are allowed, there's a, a maximum of four, but you really want to avoid four sprays during bloom. You really want to sort of fall between the two to three bloom, uh, two to three bloom sprays. The reason for that is, is that you never know when there's going to be a really terrible traumatic event uh, for your orchard during the summer season. Whether that's hail, whether that's a, a tropical storm that's moving its way up the coast, whether it's El Derecho that comes through, uh, any kind of high wind that could cause damage, it doesn't have to be hail, it's anything that would be uh, a damaging event. You would you want to use streptomycin then because you would have damage to your trees, the streptomycin will protect the wounds and limit the infection of Erwinia. There are other antibiotics that are available out there, but I discourage folks from jumping on these other antibiotics bandwagons because streptomycin still works and it's, it's very affordable. The other antibiotics just to put on your radar that are out there is this Kasumin 2L or Kasugamycin. In Pennsylvania and Southeast Pennsylvania, we only saw 30% control of blossom blight using this product. That's different than the folks who use this product in Michigan. Why? I'm not sure. That's one season's worth of data, um, but I think New York is also sees something similar. So Kasugamycin, Kasumin 2L is very expensive. Just sort of put that in the back of your mind. You don't have to worry about that now. The other one is oxytetracycline. If you have bacterial spot on peaches, you may be familiar with this product. It comes as Fireline or Mycoshield. 
Oxytetracycline is a weaker antibiotic than strep in that it doesn't kill the bacteria. It just sort of limits the reproduction of the bacterial cells. And when I've found it's just not as robust as streptomycin in keeping fire blight in check. Uh, so, and even tank mixing strep and, and oxytetracycline doesn't seem to, there's not a synergistic effect where it's better than one or the other. It actually, it, it drops the efficacy of streptomycin when you tank mix the two as far as that's what I've seen personally. So just stick with streptomycin if, if that is, um, if you have apples and they are, and during bloom time we have, uh, we have good conditions for fire blight, just stick with strep. As far as comments about alternatives, I've looked at a lot of alternatives for the last three seasons. Uh, the whole range, everything from plant-based to bacterial-based to yeast-based, uh, and everything in copper and everything in between. What I found is the ones that seem to have the most promise. Um, number one, Serenade Optimum, this is a, or Serenade Opti, I think it's now called, it's bare crop science. What I found that when you use this product at the very beginning of bloom, say when your king blooms are open, this product seems to do well. It does not do well when you use it later in bloom. It doesn't hold up as well as far as the durability of it. But if you use streptomycin at the beginning and then you follow it with strep, it seems to be a good management program, especially if the conditions aren't so severe. If it's a severe year, if it's very warm and it's wet, it's humid, there is a lot of potential for the bacteria to replicate in the flower, I would just stick with streptomycin. Uh, I, Serenade Optimum by itself, the best I've ever seen is 15% control and that was during a, a kind of a light pressure year. So it's not too robust with regards to keeping things in check. However, if you are looking for an alternative to limit the, your antibiotic sprays or if you have a really or foreseeing a very long bloom time, using Serenade at the very beginning is an, is an alternative. The other product that I and just to back up with that, there are other bacillus-based products out there. Um, I've not had the opportunity to look at them. So if I'm not talking about it, it's because I haven't had a chance to look at them yet. So the other product that shows really the most promise or promise period is Blossom Protect. And this is a yeast. It's a living yeast, Aria bacidium pullulans. And the way it works is that it colonizes the flower and it, it basically makes a roadblock to the nectaries, so if there's any bacteria on the stigmas, it cannot get into the nectaries. This product works fantastic out west, equivalent to streptomycin. Out east, I see about 35 to 40 percent control. So if you're choosing, an, if you want an alternative, and right now with organic uh, agriculture, you are not allowed to use any antibiotics. This is probably your best bet because it, it, does, it does work. There is some drawbacks with it. It does cause fruit russeting <laughs> during really wet bloom times. So if you have very russet sensitive cultivars, if it's really wet during bloom, uh, you may want to think twice about Boston Protect. Uh, um, for, this is Gala, and Gala is typically kind of not easy to russet, it, uh, but it really did a number on these Galas, and I had two locations in Blossom Protect perform the same way. Why was this year different, say, in years past? This year, right after bloom, we had about three weeks of solid wetness. So during years where it's good for apple scab, that's when fruit russeting will be ideal for our Aribacidium pullulans. The other limitation with using Blossom Protect is what you can and cannot use to manage apple scab. This is a living yeast, so it's going to be sensitive to certain fungicides. You can't use any of the, uh, you can't use sulfur, uh, you can't use your EBDCs uh, like um, um, Mancozeb or Zyram um, or Captan. Uh, there's very few products out there that the company basically says is okay to use. So. Unfortunately, during bloom time, scab is, that's when the highest number of spores are available. So it's something else to keep into consideration. If you have uh, scab resistant trees, then that's half the battle as far as mitigating scab. As far as shoot blight management, I'm running behind here, so I wanna quickly go through this. Uh, I did see that using Cueva sprays 
does limit shoot blight manage does limit shoot blight. Quaven double nickel also does, but I saw nothing statistically different between the two. There have been talk over the last few years of using Quava, which is copper octanoate sprays. This does limit shoot blight, uh, so this is an option for limiting shoot blight during the season. Uh, using prohexadione calcium, so this is Apogee or Kudos on dwarf trees on tall spindle trees, this significantly reduces the shoot growth of these trees. So if you want shoot growth, you probably don't want to be using prohexadione calcium. And low rates as in two ounces or four ounces. But it did work in limiting fire blight severity, which was good. So we need to do some more research to understand as far as uh, the timing and, and maybe potential rates for finding a sweet spot with this where you can still get some growth, not so much reduction, but also control. Semi-dwarf trees, if you have trees that are large and big, I wouldn't fool around, I would just use Apogee or Kudos. That is a surefire way of limiting shoot blight and you limit um, the potential for spreading fire blight with that way because hardening off the shoots by these chemicals limits the fire blight infection. In dwarf trees, we've seen a lot of good pro promise with regards to Actigard and Regalia. Actigard in the greenhouse and potted trees is great with limiting uh, shoot blight. However, it's super expensive. It is $32 an ounce, and it's recommended you put two ounces on. So that's $64 an acre. Uh, so it's very expensive, but it does work. The other option could, could is Regalia. Regalia is a plant-based product. We have seen promise with this with regards to limiting blossom blight but also shoot blight. It's not as, um, it doesn't control as well as Actigard, but it does do something. So you may want to consider this as far as tank mixing streptomycin and one of these plant, the systemic plant resistant inducers, um, either Actigard or Regalia to limit shoot blight. And with regards to this timings, everything. So if you are planning on using either Apogee or Actigard or Regalia, with your streptomycin at bloom, uh, you want to get that on in that first bloom spray because you need time for those products to kick in and actually work. Okay, so as far as um, apple scab and powdery mildew, just briefly go over the I'll briefly go over the diseases of these. We're talking about spraying by the numbers and resistance management. I know growers have been excellent in following us, especially when they're thinking about the frac group, group codes and rotating the products by those frat group codes for controlling disease. But there's also the challenge of these frat group codes because a lot of hot products have come out over the last few years that are great for managing disease and we're now running in the risk of overusing certain modes of action. And then I don't know if anyone in here practices alternate row middle spraying. Does anyone in here? Okay, so I won't have to make too many comments. What's that? Peaches, okay. Well, I'm gonna. T well, I'll talk. I'll make a brief comments at the very end about alternate row middle. So, when it comes to disease management, okay. So with powdery mildew, the the spores are overwintering in the buds, in whether it's the flower buds or the shoot buds. So this is where the spores are coming from. In the spring, the dormancy breaks. Those um, the fungus will colonize. Uh, developing shoots and young leaf tissue. This is a case of where there was obviously spores uh, with the blossom buds, with the flower buds, and we have an aborted blossom here. Consequently, the spores are dispersed by wind. This is a dry weather disease. Unlike apple scab, it doesn't need free standing water or considerable leaf wetness hours or any leaf wetness hours for the disease to, for infection to be triggered. All it needs is 50 to 77 degrees and greater than 70 percent humidity. You will get 70 percent humidity just within the microenvironment of the tree. So when you have a, a leaf wetting event such as can, like rain event, any kind of rain, this is a deterrent of, for infection. So typically if we have really wet springs, powdery mildew doesn't seem to be much of a problem in apples and peaches for that matter. Uh, as the leaves age, they become more resistant to powdery mildew because the powdery mildew is most problematic on very young tissue. The primary infections at tight cluster, and you really worry about powdery mildew from tight cluster till terminal shoots, so until those shoots harden off. Once the shoots harden off, they become impervious to the powdery mildew. 
As far as apple scab, just briefly, the spores are overwintering in the fallen leaves that from the previous season. And then in the spring, when, around green tip, those spores are starting to be mature, or they are, the first spores are mature, I should say. Spring rains occur, they start dispersing. And with leaf wetness, for depending on the um, uh, temperature it, and the amount of rain that falls over a period of time, those leaf wetting hours, then you would get infection. So those spores from those overwintering leaves will cause infection. When it causes infection, it produces secondary spores. And you get this vicious cycle all over again over and over through the season if you don't control it early on. So the goal is to basically disrupt that early part of the disease that those spores that are coming from the leaves and infecting the tree, you want to disrupt that section. All right, so as far as what's available now to you with regards to uh, new products, so just as a review here, Fontellus, you probably um, are familiar with Fontellus. Fontellus is a frat code group seven. Aprovia came out in 2016, that's Syngenta, frat code group seven. Circadus, which is BASF, which will be coming out this year. This is the SDHI that's in Maravon, for folks that are familiar with Maravon. Luna Tranquility and Luna Sensation, these are bo both bear crop science products. They both have a seven, but these are premixes. And then finally, Maravon is a premix, and this has a seven and 11. The 11s is the strobularian class, the QOIs. So your single mode of action QOI, QO, QOIs would be Flint or gem for peaches. As far as efficacy goes, great. Uh, they're all excellent for scab. I discourage using Fontellus for mildew. I've seen a real decrease in efficacy for mildew, um, mildew control with Fontellus. Luna Tranquility is good. It's not as strong as the other products. So with all these sevens, there's very tempted to basically throw our resistance management practices out the window. So with the frac code group seven, this chemistry, the SDHI, the SDHIs, this is an excellent chemistry. It is fantastic for scab. They're very strong, very robust, and they're very threatened from basically becoming ineffective due to overuse in the next few years. So the goal now is to stretch the longevity of efficacy of these products. But of course, it's really challenging when you have a lot of products with this mode of action in it. And since you're limited to four sprays a year, regardless of what, what SDHI you use, it's four sprays a year. So what do we do? Well, first, remember we've got a lot of other products to use during, as far as during mil, um, mildew time and scab time. This is just a snapshot. Um, we've got your uh, psyllid, we've got sulfur, amankazeb, uh, Zyram and all the different uh, SIs, and you have uh, the anilopyrimidines, which is Fraco group nine. They all vary in their efficacy, but these are still available to you. This is just a snapshot. If I have left off your favorite chemical, it's just because I can't fit it on the slide. So it's just what I could remember off the top of my head. But just keep this in mind as far as there are rotation partners that are available to you. As far as keeping in mind of, of how it would be best to utilize these chemistries, it's good to grasp and understand how the disease works. So in the case of powdery mildew, basically tight cluster, this is the time you need to start getting your sprays on and then you want to nip it in the bud early in order to limit the secondary infection um, later on. With regards to scab, when those overwintering leaves, those spores mature in the leaf, they don't all release at once. So you aren't, they, they slowly release over time. So in the very beginning at green tip, you aren't getting a ton of spores that are emerging at this time. However, from late pink through about petal fall, this is when you have the greatest number of spores that are available to cause infection and you have the greatest disease pressure at this time because of the pathogen pressure being so high. Once we get past that, it drops off. So Mother Nature wouldn't make it easy on us, of course, as far as being able to manage this. So understanding that there is this window where the scab infection would be the greatest. What I recommend is if disease conditions are present at this time, this is when you'd want to use that FRAC code group seven, this SDHI. This is the time you'd want to focus this chemistry. As far as 
uh, how to juggle all of this. Uh, number one, monitoring the disease conditions, because this will play a role in what chemicals you use and when. For instance, green tip to tight cluster. If the scab pressure is a light year, if it's dry, as, as it was, I know, last April, it was very dry during April, and that was a good powdery mildew year. Well, focus managing powdery mildew. You don't need those heavy hitter chemicals at that time. You can use Rally, Top Guard, or Rhyme. These both have the same um, um, different active, same active ingredient or sulfur at this time. Tank mix it with a broad spectrum, a broad spectrum like Mancozeb or Zyram at this time. You could do both Mancozeb and Zyram to limit scab at this time. You won't have a tremendous number of scab spores available. And if you've practiced sanitation and getting rid of those spores, and those overwintering spores from those leaves, you're even better off as far as worrying about the pressure at that time. If it is a heavy pressure year during that time and it's warm and wet, well, you've got options. Sillet still works, Vanguard, Rally. So Rally's two for one. Rally and Indar, they work against both scab and powdery mildew and be sure to tank mix it with Mancozeb or Zyram or sulfur. From pink to petal fall, this is when the highest number of spores are available. So I call my SDHIs the heavy hitters. So you want to, this is when you'd want to use those products. Your Luna Tranquility, your Luna Sensation, Aprovia, Circadus, Fontella, Smeravon. You know, all those products are excellent for this time period. They, they will, so during this time, if there is an issue with scab, that means powdery mildew is going to be not much of a threat. So Fontellus will still work because that's good against scab. Luna Tranquility, even though it wasn't strong against powdery mildew, it'll still work against scab. What I recommend is limiting two applications of SDHIs during that time period because I like seeing these Maravon or Luna Sensation products used later in the season because they do help manage storage rot. So if you store fruit, so you're able to have fruit to be able to sell throughout the season, this all definitely gets to put you in the right direction with mitigating any fruit loss you could lose in storage. As far as post petal fall to second cover, you can um, Inspire Super, Indar Rally, Vanguard, again, our scab spore availability is going to be dropping off at this time. So you don't need those heavy hitters, but you need to still be vigilant for managing scab, especially if we have conditions. You can also use these products in rotation up here as well. So just keep that in mind. So hopefully as far as a sane way of managing and going forth with all these different SDHI products. And the reason why I wanted to take the opportunity to mention this is because I've had growers that showed me their spray schedule and it's been like six SDHI sprays in a row. And I, you know, just short of having a conniption in a controlled response, realized that there needed to be a little bit more education as far as how better to approach all these sexy new chemicals coming out, um, because a lot have come out in the last few years. Okay, as far as worrying about if you see a break in scab, uh, a break in your control, wondering if it's resistance. Well, typically resistance is the last thing on my mind because I can usually trace it back to some human activity. And this is where alternate row middle comes in. If it's a really wet period, you would want to shrink your alternate row middle intervals. If at all, if it's possible, use complete sprays, especially during the bloom time, like late pink to early petal fall. Because if you don't shrink your intervals with your alternate row middle sprays, you will get alternate row middle scap. And that's what I've seen. I haven't seen resistance. I've seen basically every other side of a tree with scab and that was directly related to when they got in there and they got in there a little too late. So just be mindful of that when disease conditions are really um, severe during that time. So, and there's also other considerations too you wanna keep in mind with regards to not jumping on the fungicide resistance bandwagon. Okay, so quickly going into copper, because I only have a few minutes left. Uh, the, with, we looked at um, six different coppers, and we were just focused on how this would be for russeting. And we used Gold Delicious, which is nice and russet sensitive. We started on May 3rd, and we did 10 to 14 day interval um, through the end of July, which is way longer than what I think you'd want to use. Um, 
and we're looking at percent incidence of russet on apples and then of those apples that had russet, what percent area of the fruit had russet. So we looked at Cueva, Nordox, Master Cup, Champ, Badge, and Coastside. Cueva, Nordox, and Champ were both OMRI approved. Um, master cop, this is a this is a copper sulfate pentahydrate, so this is a liquid copper. Um, they all vary in their metallic copper rates, and we used it. Based, I think the rate that we used it was one ounce of metallic copper um, to the acre. That was what we were aiming for. So it was much lower than what the label is saying. And what we found was Nordox did the best with regards to the total number of fruit that did not have fruit russet. And that was followed by Nordox combined with lime. Lime will attenuate the phytotoxic effects of, of uh, copper. Uh, that was the case with Champ. But what was surprising was that Cueva used it at an extreme like we did, even at a low rate of one ounce of the metallic uh, copper. It was pretty high with incidence. So just FYI. Uh, I have talked to growers where they said, well, if you use an even less rate and fewer sprays, you may not see an issue, and that's correct. I mean, we may not see an issue. This was the extreme. We sprayed a lot, and it was at a rate, obviously, that could cause fruit rusting. However, of the fruit that did have fruit rusted, only there wasn't even 7% of the fruit that was fruit rusted. So it was not negligible, but it, was, um, it wasn't a terrible uh, coverage of the fruit that had russet. But Nordox did have the least amount of russet on those apples. Nordox does say that their copper is safe for fruit. It is um, as far as with regards to fruit injury. It's commonly used on tomatoes because it's red. Even though it has that high metallic rate, it seems to be okay with regards to, um, um, with regards to uh, crop injury. All of these other um, products, they were similar as far as statistic goes, but the one to point out is really Nordox there, which was pretty interesting. So as far as comments about copper, so Nordox does appear to be safe. Um, I'll be real curious to see how this product holds up with regards to disease management because this could potentially be another tool for us, especially when practicing resistance management. We have looked at Cueva with regards to some disease management in the last year. Um, with regards to fruit rusting though, Gala, Golden Deli or Red Delicious in Rome are okay, Golden Delicious not so much. Um, so even a uh, minimal number of sprays at two quarts to the acre of Cueva, we did see an uptick with regards to fruit rusting. As far as disease management goes beyond fire blight, it does seem to control sooty blotch and some rots. Scab, the jury's still out. Fly speck, ironically, does not seem to be at all affected by Cueva. So with that, that was very fast. <laughs> Any quick questions? I don't want to hold up lunch because I'm sure folks are hungry. But I'll be here through lunch, so if anyone wants to talk to me then. Um, but any quick questions? I guess maybe one question before lunch. Questions for Terry? Yeah, all the way. Oh, that's a thumbs up. <laughs> oh, you have a question. I actually have a question here. Um, I took plant pathology in the last semester, last century. Um, back then, they would say that a warm winter like this would be more likely to carry powdery mildew and fire blight through. Do people still believe that or is that just Well yeah. I have I have heard that like temperatures at like minus four degrees Celsius seems to kill off powdery mildew spores. So yes. I, you know I mean I think anything that doesn't get down to too terribly below, but I will say this is that uh, it doesn't matter with fire blight. I mean, we had a terrible uh, fire blight year in 2014. And you remember 2014? As I was driving over the Bay Bridge um, today, I was remembering it was this Chesapeake Bay was frozen solid in 2014 this time of year. And that was a terrible fire blight year. So as far as fire blight goes, and the weather's not, there's not really a link. But powdery mildew, yes, there is. 